Well, good mornings. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Welcome to City Line today. Ah, praise the Lord. For all of you that are watching online, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Jack. And I get to be a part of this great community of faith. And I'm ex so excited to be able to uh, come together and worship with you. And thank God for this opportunity that I have today just to kind of share my heart uh, with you here uh, this morning. But how, how many know that God is good? <laughs> have you recognized that God is good in your life? Has he been good to you? <laughs> if he woke you up this morning, you know God's been good to you. <laughs> it beats the alternative, I, you know. <laughs> so God is good. And, and when it comes to God's goodness and God's love for you and me, according to Scripture, there are no limits to his goodness. Amen. But here's the rub. The very idea of God's goodness and God's love for you and for me uh, being limitless, we find it difficult to fathom that. We don't quite understand that. And I think the reason is because for, for God, the words love and goodness have a much deeper meaning than they do for us. Scripture reminds us of the depth of God's love in John 3 16 uh, when it tells us that God so loved us that he gave his one and only son in exchange for us the apostle Paul even tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 that the love of God is so wide and so long so high so deep that it surpasses all knowledge and so we just don't understand that kind of love why would God love me like that? Who am I that God would love me like that? I'm no one special. What have I done for God to love me like that? You see, that kind of love is incomprehensible to us. The idea that God loves us so deeply that nothing in all creation, nothing in time or space can alter the love that God has for us is absolutely beyond our way of thinking simply because we ourselves don't love on that level. But here's the good news. We don't have to perfectly understand the whys and the how comes of God's love for us. We just need to accept his love given to us and for us. We don't have to per perfectly understand how, how all this works in order for us to trust that God's ways are the best way for us in our life. We just have to step out and follow him. And as we do, we have the promise that he will always lead us. He will always guide us into the greater things that he has for us in our life. God is always there. We know that. He's always there to help us through every situation that we will ever face in our life. And we'll be there no matter what. Whatever we face, God is there to help us. And this is evident as we look at the scripture. We can see that God is presented to us in the Bible in many different ways to show us just how vast and how infinite God really is. For example, scripture presents God as a powerful creator, as a reigning king and a redeeming savior. He is also our loving father, our strong rock. He is our safe refuge. He is the almighty and all powerful one and a myriad of other images. And yet at the same time, he is the still small voice that comes and speaks to our hearts. Each of these pictures communicate a unique and important aspect of our awesome God and our relationship to him. But there's one metaphor that uh, no one metaphor can convey the whole of who God really is and what he does and how he truly loves us. 
But the metaphor that most passionately and humanly describes God is that of a shepherd that David writes about in the 23rd Psalm. For the past three weeks, God has blessed us as a church with the opportunity to unpack and to go deeper into this amazing psalm. As we have been studying this psalm, this psalm we've, we've been able to explore and embrace the, the shepherd metaphor that David uses so powerfully, showing just how loving and caring God, our good shepherd, really is. We've embraced the fact that, that God is our divine shepherd. We've also had to embrace the fact of our own sheepness. Amen. We've been brought to the realization that according to the Bible, we are not soaring eagles. We are not lone wolves or even teddy bears. We are stubborn and wayward sheep. We are sheep who are desperately in need of and desperately dependent on the meticulous care and guidance and love of our good shepherd. We have seen this fact as David writes this psalm proclaiming and, and really sometimes even shouting just how good God is and how well God, the good shepherd, takes such good care of his sheep. And because of that great care, God's sheep lack for nothing. This morning, I've been given the honor to attempt to kind of wrap this series up by focusing on the final two verses of this beautiful psalm, verses 5 and 6. And I want to read these two verses in the context of the entire, script, uh, the entire psalm today. And I would like to ask you to take out your Bibles and join me as, as I read this, uh, this scripture this morning, beginning with verse 1. Will you join me in reading this passage. I'll be reading from the, uh, the New International Version, but you can follow along on the screen if you would like. This is what David writes. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." I love how David portrays God as his shepherd because that image conveys so beautifully the message that God is supremely devoted to caring for and providing for his sheep, guiding their steps, feeding their souls, and restoring their spirit. But as we come to verse 5, all of a sudden the metaphor shifts and David portrays God in a different light now. The imagery deepens as David moves from God, the, the shepherd, to God, the gracious host. You need to understand that in, ancient, in the ancient East, where David was from, being the host was a big deal. As the host, you were expected to care for and meet the needs of, of your guests. But what we're going to see is that God is no ordinary host. He is a super host. He goes above and beyond to lavishly care for his people. And David writes these words again, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows here the scene shifts from an outdoor field to an indoor meal David now transitions from a sprawling countryside with green pastures to a grand royal hall. He goes from a deep valley to a dining table and from waters of uh, still waters to an overflowing cup now. 
And although it may seem like a drastic shift at first, it really isn't. David moves seamlessly from describing God as a shepherd to describing him as a host of a banquet. And yet, despite the shift in these vivid images, these verses maintain the one dominant theme that runs throughout the entire psalm. And that is God's love and God's care for you and I, his sheep. His people, whether God is pictured as a good shepherd or a gracious host, whether David sees himself as one of the sheep or an invited guest, the message is still the same. God is always attending to the needs of David and the needs of all of those who follow him, taking care of their every need and loving them always. Look at that imagery again. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. The word prepare means to arrange or to set in order, to set in place. Here God is understood to be setting a table before David and putting everything in its right place. The dishes are perfectly positioned. The drink is poured. The meal is cooked and the meal is served. Every detail has been given the strictest attention. Nothing David could possibly want or need has been overlooked or admitted on this table. This is how David sees the Lord caring for him. God is feeding him the meat of his word. He is pouring his truth into David's soul and bringing him much needed joy and peace. David has never been so satisfied. You, you got to forgive me. I get excited when I talk to Okay. Okay. I, 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 I just have to say that because I, I see some of the looks on your face. What are the... Why, why, why is this guy yelling at me? It's not that I'm yelling. I'm, I'm just excited about the Lord. I'm, I'm excited about this. Amen. And I want you to be excited about Jesus today. Amen. God satisfies my soul, and I want him to satisfy your soul also. My friend, this same service that, that was available to David is available to each and every one of us today who believe in and put our trust in God. We are all given a place at God's royal table and treated like the guest of a king. And as we sit at his table throughout, throughout the entire feast, what we need to recognize is that the Lord's watchful eye is always upon us. He is anticipating our every need. And in his perfect timing, he is bringing to the table exactly what we need precisely when we need it. What David is doing here is showing us the abundance of God's provision and protection and God's incomparable love in action so that we would lack for nothing. These metaphors of shepherd and host, they really go hand in hand. As David is shifting from the good shepherd in verses 1 through 4 to God being the gracious host in verse 5, David isn't shifting from first into reverse or, 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 or from first to fifth. No, he's, he's going smoothly from first gear into second gear, letting us know that whether we are sheep or whether we are guests, God's love and God's provision and God's protection is for us and with us no matter what. All the days of our life. That's what David is highlighting in this psalm. Only now, the green pastures of verse 2 have become a table. But not just any table. It's a prepared 
dining table, a table prepared with great love and great attention to detail, a table prepared for a great feast and, and wonderful wonderful hospitality of the host is demonstrated by the fact that he is anointing his guest's head with oil. Now, while that doesn't sound very appealing to us today to have someone pour oil on your head before you eat, in the ancient custom of hospitality and respect shown to the esteemed dinner guests, that was how they did it. In this way, they welcomed and honored the guest into the protection of their home by anointing the invitee's head with oil. So some of our modern translations has changed the phrase, you anoint my head with oil, to you welcome me as an honored guest by rubbing my head with oil. Another one says, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. The oil was a mixture of fragrant perf perfumes so, so as to relax and refresh and to soothe the guests. So this was a way that the good host would honor his guests of the ancient Near East. Remember when Jesus was invited uh, to, to Simon the Pharisee's home? In Luke chapter 7, and Jesus compared the hospitality of Simon to, to the honor given to him by a sinful woman. <laughs> Jesus said, you, Simon, when I came into your home, you did not anoint my head with oil. You didn't honor me. You didn't respect me. You were a Pharisee. You thought you were above me. And yet you invited me into your home. And the fact that you didn't anoint my head with oil tells me you didn't respect me. But this woman, who you call a sinner, has continuously anointed my feet with fragrant oil. My friend, it's a statement of honor. It's just not only a, a statement of welcome, but a statement of honor. Come into my house, and in my house there is safety. My friend, when God anoints our head with oil, we know that we've been welcomed into the house of God to sit at his table. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. So the statement, you anoint my head with oil, speaks of the hospitality and honor shown to David along with the Lord's ministry to refresh David's heart while at the same time symbolized the joy and the gladness that God brought into David's life. David recognized that, that his standing as a guest was, was not merely that of a short-term visitor who would be entertained once and then sent off on his way. Nor would he be invited to return for a meal only occasionally. David rejoiced that he had been granted a high honor of a per perpetual place setting at the Lord's supper table throughout his entire life. He was welcomed. At God's table. Notice the still waters of verse 2 have now become a cup. And not just a full cup, but a cup that is overflowing. A cup that we might describe today as, as having unlimited refills. The overflowing cup was, was a powerful symbol in the day of David. Host in the ancient East used, used it, uh, it to send a message to their guests. As long as the cup was kept full, the guests knew he was welcomed. But when the cup sat empty on the table... The host was hinting to the guest that the hour was late. I'm tired, so you now you need to get up on out of here. <laughs> but in those occasions when the host was really enjoying the company of the guest, the host would pour into the cup until it overflowed onto the table, telling the guest that you are welcome to stay and sit at my table no matter the lateness of the hour. You are here for the duration of time. 
So David is using this symbolically to say that his heart isn't large enough to contain all of the blessings that God wants to give him and give to us today. God continues to pour his blessings out on us until our hearts are so full and his, uh, of his blessings that, that, that literally they're overflowing over the edge and down on the table. David felt so blessed by his host. Gracious abundance always provided, providing more than he ever needed. He rejoiced in that fact. That my God's just not going to meet my need one time. Or two times. Three times. God will always meet my needs. Because God is always pouring out his blessings upon me. Even when I don't see him. He's pouring his blessings out upon me even when I don't feel them he's still pouring his blessings out on me all I have to do is open up my eyes and just comprehend that God is still God he has not changed he will not change he is the same forever and he will always pour those blessings that I need out upon me when I need them this my friend, is an amazing table that David is talking about. It's a table full of, of the best food you could ever imagine. There was anything and everything you would ever want or need at this table. And the cup full of an endless blessings and joy being poured out. What David is doing is showing us that God does not cut corners when it comes to taking care of you and I today. David is painting a great picture of the abundance of God for all of us. But it's also a picture of God's abundant protection. I don't know if you noticed, but David has not even left the valley of the shadow of death yet. From verse 4. He's still passing through. And how do, how do we know that? Because verse 5 tells us that this lavish feast, this amazing table has been prepared where? In the presence of David's enemies. He's still walking through that valley. But God has never left him. And now God has prepared a table for him. David is seated at this large banquet table with his enemies in plural standing all around him. Think about that. Sitting at a table with your enemies and your adversary standing next to you all while the Lord is serving you. <laughs> Think about that a little bit today. Sitting right there in the dark places where death and disaster is so close that it casts a shadow over everything in your life. Sitting there amidst the pig slip and the doctor's bad call and, and the dear John letters, you know. But right there in those dark places of life, sitting there in the middle of those situations where fear and worry and doubt and uncertainty would usually leave us spiritually starving. Sitting right there. God not only protects us from harm and danger, but he feeds us in front of all those enemies of our soul with his loving and lavish provisions. All of this is done in the presence of our spiritual, our physical, and our emotional enemies, not in the absence of them. God didn't remove those things. He's still in the valley. He's sitting at God's table in the midst of all of these enemies. And God is still blessing him. David is simply letting us know that in the midst of the conflict, we can and will find God's provision and his abundant blessings no matter what. David knew 
what it was like to be on the run far from home in the valley. See, he, he knew what it was like to be, uh, to have his enemies in hot pursuit of him. He knew what it was like to be hiding in caves with no clear end in sight. But right there, when we would expect David to feel the most abandoned and the most vulnerable, right there walking through the valley of death, he tells us that he is enjoying a banquet of God's blessings, of love, of joy, of peace, of hope, of faith, comfort, and encouragement. Well, hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. David declared in verse 4, even though I'm walking through the, this valley of death and discomfort, I do not have anything to fear. I, I can see you out there, but I don't have to fear you. I know you're near me, but I don't have to fear you. Why? Because God is with me. Therefore, I am not afraid. Listen, God provides exactly what we need, not by removing our enemies, rather he provides for our needs in the midst of our enemies. <laughs> I know how we are, though. We're facing some stuff in our life, and we're saying, God, deliver me from this. God, don't, don't, don't let me have to walk through this. But God is saying, yeah, walk through it. I will deliver you, but I want you to be blessed. I want you to enjoy the blessings of God knowing that even you're, if you're in the middle of all of this, I have never left you. I have never forsaken you. I am still with you and will be with you always. This, this, is a, uh, uh, this image is striking to me. You're enjoying a meal after a long, hard day, surrounded by people and things that, that want to hurt you and harm you. And, and, and I know the obvious question is, is how, how peaceful can that be? I mean, that sounds pretty stressful, right? How can I enjoy a meal surrounded by my enemies? Well, first, let's not forget God isn't just a host. He is a shepherd also. And shepherds would always carry with them a rod and staff for protection of their sheep. We can sit at his table in peace because God has promised to protect us. He is ready to strike anything that comes to harm us. We don't have to worry about those things that come against us because we serve a God who is bigger and stronger and who is looking out for us always. Wouldn't you like to go through the hard times of your life with that kind of perspective? In the midst of those very difficult circumstances and in the presence of your enemies, wouldn't you like to eat at God's table instead of hiding under the table in fear and frustration? <laughs> Only God can take care of us like this. What a faithful shepherd he is. What an amazing host our God really is. This is why David could say, my cup overflows. He's, he re, he's referring to the continuing outpouring of God's fullness and faithfulness into his life. David learned that God's supply far exceeds his needs. David was not given a mere mercy drops from heaven, but a deluge of grace far more than he could ever comprehend. God was so gracious in pouring out his goodness into David's life that his cup could not contain it. His heart was overflowing with divine provisions. This speaks of the fullness of the blessings that God has for not only David, but for every single one of us here today. As far as David was concerned, God had opened his vast storehouse and was pouring out grace upon grace and joy upon joy and peace upon peace and blessings upon blessings in David's life. And he will do the same for you and I today. Amen. Look at where David goes in the first part of verse 6. He not only wants to stress that God gives, his, gives us his plenty, his abundance for today. But he also, he also stresses that he's going to, God's going to give us plenty for the days to come. David writes that the shepherd's goodness and love 
and mercy will follow me on Sundays and Tuesdays when I'm in church. <laughs> That's only partly true in the scripture. His love and mercy will follow me sometimes. His love and goodness will follow me just when I need it. No, David said, the shepherd's goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. In light of what David had already done for him, or what God had already done for him, David speaks confidently here of, of what God will continue to do for him the rest of his life. David has already experienced how good God takes care of him, and David knows that because of because God is faithful and not fickle, that kind of care he will always enjoy because it will always continue. I like what. Sheep rancher turned pastor Philip Keller wrote about this verse. He said, not only is this a bold statement, but it is somewhat of a boast, an exclamation of implicit confidence in the one who controls his career and destiny. How many Christians actually feel this way about Christ? How many of us are truly convinced that no matter what occurs in our life, we are being followed by God's love and his goodness and his mercy always. Of course, it's very simple to speak this way when things are going well. But what about when one's body begins to break down? What is my reaction when my job folds up and there's no money to meet the bills? What do I say when suddenly without Good grounds, friends prove false and turn against me. These are the sort of times that test a person's confidence in the care of Christ. When my little world is falling apart and the dreams uh, and, and the dream castles of my ambition and hopes crumble into ruins, can I honestly declare, surely, yes, surely, God's love and God's goodness shall follow me. All the days of my life. That's where the challenge is. Are we recognizing that when we're walking through the valley, God has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies in that valley and that he is there to help us see us through when he wants us to simply follow him. The Hebrew word that David uses here translated as follows is the word that is often tra translated as pursued. David knew what it felt like to be pursued by evil men, to be pursued by wickedness and wrath. But I have no doubt that David was able to endure that kind of persecution simply by reminding himself that God's love and God's goodness and mercy would passionately pursue him all the days of his life. And look at the confidence that David expresses again. Not only is David rejoicing and confident in God's abundance and God's plenty for today and God's plenty every day, but he is confident that he will enjoy God's plenty forever. David didn't say that maybe love will follow me. Maybe goodness will follow me or possibly love and goodness might follow me. He didn't say that. He didn't say I have a hunch that love and goodness will follow me. David said, David, he could have used any of those phrases, but he didn't. And the reason is because David believed in a sure God who makes sure promises and provides a sure foundation for God's people to stand on. Praise the Lord. Our moods may shift, but God's doesn't. Our minds may change, but God's doesn't. Our devotion may falter, but God's never does. Even if we are faithless, he is faithful, for he cannot betray himself. He is a sure God today. And because he is a sure God, we can state confidently that God's love and goodness will follow us all the days of our life. And we will 
dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My friend, that's a huge statement. Look at the size of that statement. God's love, his goodness, his mercy. It's going to follow me all the days of my life. Praise the Lord. In those days of trial and test that you go through, you can lean on him. In those days of sickness and pain, you can feel him touch your body and give you healing. In those days of loneliness and brokenheartedness, he will dry your eyes and wrap his loving arms around you and comfort you and let you know that you are not alone. You will never walk alone. He will follow you. Amen. As you follow him, (laughs) he will pursue you. He will run after you when you run from him. He will be there to pick you up when you stumble and fall. David said that God's love and goodness is going to follow me no matter what. No matter where I go, God's love will forever be there. His goodness will forever be there. Do you have that same confidence today? If you don't, you can have. You can have that confidence today in the Lord. But what do you suppose David meant when he was saying that he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever? See, in most cases when that phrase is used in the Old Testament, it simply refers to either the portable Israelite temple called the the tent of meeting, or it refers to the brick and mortar temple in Jerusalem. And since David lived before the temple in Jerusalem was built... (laughs) Was he saying that he was going to take up residence in the tent of meeting? Was that what he meant by he was going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Maybe he was saying he was going to be buried there. I don't think it meant meant any of those. I don't think he was referring to any of that. Let me just share, first of all, a couple Passages of scripture from the book of Psalms, Psalms 27. This is what the writer says. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. In Psalms 92, this is what it says. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and and grow like the cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In both of these passages of Scripture, David is using terms like house of the Lord and temple and the the courts of our God to refer not, not ultimately to a physical location, but to refer to a fellowship with God in God's presence. Fellowship with God's presence and with you. But when I leave this place, what happens then? You see, sometimes we're, we're, we're Christians from Sunday to Sunday. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> We have difficulty from Sunday to Sunday. But what David is talking about, I am going to live in the presence of God always. I don't have to go all the time and be all the time in the house of God. Now, let me tell you this. You need to come to the house of God. I I, I pastored for... For a long time. (laughs) And and, and I want people to know you need to come to the house of God. Because you get strength by coming and fellowshipping with one another. You get strength by hearing the word of God. It helps you kick off the rest of your week. So that you can come back full of victory. And not have to pray through to victory again the next Sunday. Well, I'm just, I'm just trying to help us here a little bit. All right. 
I might be getting myself in some trouble, but. <laughs> so please come to the house of God. Okay, that's, that's where I want to leave that. You, it's necessary to come to the house of God. But it's also necessary when you leave this place, you don't leave the presence of God. Amen. You take the presence of God with you. You live in the presence of God each and every day, worshiping him, fellowshipping with him. Under the old covenant, the temple was where God's special presence dwelt among his people. It's the place his people came to be forgiven and to worship. So David's confidence is that he will dwell in the fullness of the temple, of what the temple represents. That he will dwell in the presence, God's presence forever in that place of forgiveness and worship. In a sense, the way David ends this psalm adds a new fullness to the beginning of this psalm. What David is really saying is the Lord is my shepherd forever. I lack nothing forever. He makes me to lie down in green pastures forever. He leads me beside quiet waters forever because I'm dwelling in his presence forever in that place of forgiveness and worship forever the most amazing thing about Psalms 23 is not the poetry uh, po po poetry or, or timeless in quality the most amazing thing is that anyone can know today the same kind of care that David experienced in his day Psalms 23 is an open door into the field of the divine shepherd so that we don't have to imagine how David felt we can know how David felt <laughs> through our faith in God we can be part of God's flock in fact the abundance that David experienced then was itself just a foretaste of what was to come in other words David enjoyed a sweet sip but we today have been given the entire cup of God's blessings. But how do we access this kind of abundance? How do we enjoy a life without lack? How do we enjoy God's plenty for today, every day, and forever? Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did, did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We access Psalms 23, this, this Psalms 23 kind of abundance only through one door. And that door is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the shepherd of Psalms 23 in human flesh. The same shepherd that David spoke about is the same shepherd that is speaking to us here in, Psalm, in John chapter 10. And, what, and he is speaking to us today and saying that we, if we want to access God's pastures of abundance, you have to go through me, through Christ, because he is the door. This morning, you are in either one or two places spiritually. You are either in God's posture of abundant life or you are in the wastelands of this world, a wasteland of sin, trying to live a me-centered life in a God-centered universe. You see, if, you, if, we are not a, if we are not, we are not a part of God's flock, if we're living in the wasteland. Because in the wasteland, it's dry, it's desolate, it's rocky. The wasteland of sin that, that is a place of spiritual, it's a place of spiritual hunger. It's a place of spiritual thirst. 
a place of fear and worry and selfishness and confusion and restlessness and despair, a place of danger and a place where ultimately our waywardness and our stubbornness leads us straight to a valley of God's judgment and justice, a wasteland of this world that is a terrible place to be. But Jesus came in order to open up the door. And on the other side of that door is green pastures, still waters, a prepared table, a cup overflowing. On the other side of the door is goodness and mercy and love and abundance. On, on the other side of that door is a life without lack. Listen to the abundance and plenty of God's pasture. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. This is the table that God has prepared for us. There is everything you would ever need set on this table. It lacks nothing. And Jesus invites us today to come to his table and dine with him. He says, this bread is my body given for you. This cup is my blood shed for you. Eat and drink all of you in remembrance of me. What an amazing table this is. This is a table where we are living life out of overflow and out of the abundance of our good, good father. All of us are sheep. There's no escaping that fact. But where you are grazing is another question. Are you wandering aimlessly or are you resting securely in the promises of the good shepherd? If you were a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, if you have entered that gate through faith, then you need to remember what God has already done for you and walk in that confidence that God's love and his goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. You need to live the well-fed life and stop acting like you're starving for something else. Stop looking through the fence at the wasteland thinking that there's something better out there. There's not, my friend. Savor God's blessings. Praise Him. Thank Him. Keep your eyes on the shepherd and listen to His voice. If you have not quite yet made that decision to follow Jesus, I want to encourage you to listen again to His words. As He tells you, I am the door. If any of you enter, you do so through me if you will be saved you will come through me and you'll find green pastures that pasture is only possible because the good shepherd laid down his life for you and for me Jesus was nailed on the Roman cross for us he took our place he took God's judgment against our waywardness and stubbornness and he laid down his life but the good news is he took it up again for you and for me that we might live a life of abundance so where are you this morning which side of the fence are you on who or what is your shepherd God wants you to know the extent to which you can experience life without lack a life of abundance that just doesn't seem possible because it does not quit. It's better than a city line party. <laughs> Amen. And I love city line parties. <laughs> but all you have to do is just open your heart and let the Lord be your shepherd. Bow your head with me if you would, please. Father God, as I come before you in prayer right now, God, I'm so very glad, so very grateful for this opportunity and this great honor that you have blessed me with. Be able to share, God, with this wonderful, wonderful community of faith. God, I pray that something that has been said has been a blessing to somebody, God. And Lord, I pray that maybe, Lord, that there was 
if there was questions on some people's minds, God, but those questions are now answered. You are the good shepherd. You are the gracious host. And God, as we sit at your table today, God, you are ready to meet our every need. So Lord, those that don't know you, may they turn to you this day. May they commit their life to you, God, and give themselves to you as you have given yourself to them. God, come into their life, we pray. God, for those that do know you, may our minds be more clear now than ever of your goodness and what you do for us and want to do for us as long as we keep our eyes upon you. God, we praise you for what you've already done we're praising you for what you're doing now and God for what you're about to do in hearts and lives. We honor you. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.